Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. Very, very good. There's a lightning storm out there right now. Huge sheet oh, lightning. Sure is. Just got back from a little bit of stick and puck huh? <laughs> hockey practice in Leduc. Uh-huh. Went with my uh, my wife, who's a big hockey fanatic too. Hockey date night in Canada, and I guess you're back the from partner, right? Eh? Yeah. Well, no, she's not my. She's uh, she's switched to forward now. Oh, has she? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, my deep partner is actually a, a neighbor of mine. He, he joined the oh, team. Yeah. He's my uh, defense partner. He's a good friend of mine, D. Uh, Johnson, and uh, we are now partners. So, she's a forward. She she didn't like okay. that. You know. We know you know when you make a mistake on D, the pucks in the back of the net. Right. She didn't like that feeling too much. So maybe she well, just was up, got sick of cleaning up your messes. I th- think that's probably it in more areas than one, <laughs> <laughs> and sick of it in more areas than one. All right, Bruce, you were at Rogers Place for the Edmonton Rogers, Rogers game. Four three, four three A. We won the first game of the year. The Oilers. Um, this will be our two good things and two bad things. We're not going to do numbers because there was no numbers other than the score. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're also going to talk about Kyler Yamamoto's new contract. So, but let's start, Bruce, with okay. the game. What is your good thing from the game? Well, the fact that the Oilers were able to dig out of an early hole and uh, come back for the win, and I think that was sparked by their power play, which produced a couple of very pretty goals. Uh, on their first two chances and uh, uh, both drew them to within a goal and kind of set the stage for uh, scoring star Philip Kemp to uh, <laughs> both tie and win the game down the stretch. But uh, it was uh, Henry Rubinsky who was the scoring star in the in the uh, early part of the game with the two power play goals and he had later also had an assist. And he's a former draft pick of Florida Panthers and I tell you, the first goal in particular was an absolute beauty. Great uh, um, cross ice diagonal pass from Ostap Safin from the end boards, where he was uh, uh, <clears throat> on the left or on the right wing <coughs> side, being, uh, sort of level with the face off dot. And he zinged a, a beautiful hard diagonal pass out to Yanni Caldas on left point. And Caldas had got the puck with, you know, time and space to make a play and make a play is exactly what he did because he saw Rubinsky um, <clears throat> alone near the top of the crease and he fired a hard kind of shot pass and Rubinsky just had to get a stick on it and uh, and redirect it into the corner and that was a to me that looked like a major league goal like those were those were high quality <clears throat> plays by by all three men and it came at the end of a strong power. They were actually the second unit. The first unit generated some chances too with uh, uh, the first line of, uh, of um, uh, Xavier Borgo and um, Lavoie and Hamblin. Lavoie and James Hamblin uh, with Tyler Tulio also in that mix and Philip Robery was the first unit. And they, they generated some nice chances and Calgary finally got the puck out and they changed up and the second unit came back just as hard and put one in the net. <clears throat> and they also got a, a nice goal in the second period again off a very fine pass by Ostaf Safin who had a had a real good game. And he was uh, he was noticeable on more than just these goals, but again a real nice pass off the end wall, this time directly to the goal scorer, who uh, got a quick shot and put it right in the top corner. Came, that one kind of came out of nowhere. The first one, there was a good long build up to, but the second one. <coughs> and so, kudos for them for capitalizing on the power plays, because up until that point, the Oilers had done almost nothing at even strength, and it was only because of the power play that they had uh, that they were kind of hanging around in the game. That you know they were able to get a couple of breaks later and and, uh, and win it. Yeah, some very chaotic. Uh, defending early in that game. Um, my good thing, Bruce, will be uh, it'll be the big boys brigade, how they came on through the game. They started out quite weak. These, this is the big ass- assortment or uh, <laughs> of gigantic hulking defense builders have acquired and are now kind of breaking in 
well, all at once, all at once together. Some of them have been here before, but they're all here together now. So that that group includes um, Philip Broberry, Broberg in, in North America, Michael Kesselring, Marcus Niemelein, and Philip Berryland, Phil Kemp, Vincent DeHarnay, who didn't play tonight and is, is on an AHL contract, mm -hmm. and uh, Dmitry Samarukov. So um, six of those guys were in the game tonight and they all, they were, you know, they had a rough go of it early on. There was lots of mistakes. Uh, Broberry, Niemelainen, Kesselring, Kemp got beat on a rush. Sure um, oh. He got beat pretty good there. Barry Lynn got caught uh, in the neutral zone on one goal. I, I can't speak honestly, Bruce, with... Um, great authority on this game because I was watching you were, you were there live yeah, in was. the press box. I was there. I was watching on uh, the internet and the mm -hmm. internet coverage was okay, but there's no re replays. You can't replay it yourself. And like, I love to watch the scoring chance, pl chance plays again. Wind, it's all, wind her back, eh? You could not. So oh. it, was, it was a little bit hard to, you know, I was going to grade all the players and give a great game grade to everybody. I just realized that this is impossible. Uh, so I just focused on the big boys brigade and, they started off weak, but they came on strong. I thought Castle Ring played better in the third. He started to, he's kind of, he can be a little bit lumbering now and then, but he, he was, you know, starting to win more battles and move the puck. Kemp made a number of nice pinches and he got his two goals. And, you know, you could say, well, those both those goals were kind of fluky goals. They were. One was through a screen, one was a deflection, but he joined the play. He, 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 he uh, got in deep. He was, and he put the puck on net. Good things happen, you know, what's not to like? Uh, I thought uh, Philip Broberry was skating miles and uh, playing really well. I, I thought he looked good. Um, it wasn't as bad. It wasn't the best game I've seen him play, but it was just this really solid professional, you know, kind of Oscar cleft bomby kind of game struck me. Um, Philip Berryland, who when we last saw him in Sweden in the fall, was stiff and not very good. He looked, I thought, very good. Um, he was very calm and composed, always in position, always making the right play. It was kind of the player I was expecting to see last fall, but I guess injury really was kind of crippling his game. <clears throat> so he's past that, and he came on. Nima Linen is um, kind of a really tall version of Chris Russell. <laughs> he's good, really good at He's fast on his skates, and he's a defensive-minded player, but he he's not the greatest passer of the puck. Like, he would get the puck, and so, sometimes he was doing the old Steve Steos backpack. Remember, remember how Steve Steos and Laddie Smith sometimes would get the puck at center ice, and they would gradually work their way back, passing yeah. it back and forth till they were, like, standing beside each other behind the Oilers' net? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meanwhile, I had a little bit of that going on in this game, too. But he he came on. He was he started to skate skate better. He and Kesselring formed a strong partnership um, as the game went on. So the big boys brigade would be that's my good thing. Right on. Yeah. Well, Berryland, he he was uh, sorry Brobery. He was a he was a um, real eye catcher. Um, he's a higher high risk high reward kind of player. He does take risks, and he's going to have to uh, buff some of that <clears throat> stuff out of his game because. Sometimes it's it's high risk, low reward, you know. And yeah. You got you got to get rid of that stuff where it's uh, it's you know where if it goes wrong it's a disaster. If it goes right, you know it's like the old quarterback throws to the sidelines. If he makes the pass, it's a six yard gain. If he doesn't make it, it's six points for the other team. You know you got you got to pick your pick your spots. Uh, but that said, he impressed the heck out of me with uh, some of his just athleticism. I mean, some of the puck battles that he won weren't battles at all. And this way, he compares a little bit to a guy that I've frequently heard him compare to, uh, Darnell Nurse. Uh, similarly, very high first-round draft choice whose size, speed, and overall athleticism just enables him to... Uh, I call them puck battles. Other people call them races to the puck. Call them what you will. If there's a free puck and your team winds up with it because your guy's either faster, stronger, or... Uh, has more guile than the other team. It doesn't really matter which one of those things it is. Uh, Brovery was winning races to pucks. And what impressed me about him uh, was a couple of real subtle passes that he made where he was under pressure, and often you'll see a young guy just fire the puck away hard and, you know, put it right past his own winger and right onto the stick of the guy at the point for the pressure to continue. 
And uh, there was at least two, maybe three plays like that where in, in his own zone under pressure where Burberry was uh, uh, not only made the quick decision and the right decision in terms of who to pass to, but he was able to put the right sort of weight on the pass that he just touched it up to where the guy could get it as opposed to anybody on the other team. And that's a, that's a nice subtle skill for such a young player. And I mean, something to watch for going forward, of course. But uh, but tonight there was uh, the plays that he made where the Oilers maintained possession after he passed it off, where normally you might expect it's just going to be dumped out or it's going to be turned over. Instead, he was uh, hitting the target with a good pass. I noticed two plays, once one of the power play and one of the uh, neutral zone, where he read the other team, uh, there was a loose puck, a uh, 50-50 puck, and he used his speed and reach and size to get, win those pucks, to keep the puck in, or to, mm-hmm. to advance the puck in the, in, from the neutral zone. And I, I was impressed with that, that he he made the right decision and he won the battle, like he got there first and won it. And he, he has some rough edges to his game. Yes, sir. He's not the player he's going to be. He just turned 20. Um, he he will be in the HL. I think that's 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 good. That's where he belongs. Playing lots of minutes down there. Probably on the top pairing with Berlin. I liked him on the top. I don't think he's going to be a power player in the NHL, but I liked him getting that chance, that opportunity. Hope they stick with that in Bakersfield. He do, he passed the puck well. He distributed it well, and you know he he can he uh, can put the puck on net as well. So uh, yeah, yeah, it was a good debut for uh, for his season. Bruce, what is your uh, what's your bad thing? Well, it has to be the way the game started, uh, and I won't dwell over long on this because I know you're going to talk about it. But I mean, the very very first uh, sequence of the game, and I'm sure there even was a whistle. Uh, uh, the first defense change was from uh, uh, Berryland and, and Broberry to uh, uh, Samorkov and Kemp, and Samorkov on his first shift. Uh, stepped up for two hits, and on the second one, he basically got run over by a big, huge Calgary forward, uh, Duel, Doer, 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 who was like 6'3, 211, going fast, and he just got the better of the collision. And Smorkov, uh, uh, who was the initiator of the hit, went down hard, and then he went off, and that was it for his night after one shift. And then the Oilers were. Uh, they were really kind of, whether that contributed to it or whether that was just part of the bigger scene that Calgary was more ready for the start of the game. But by the five-minute mark, it was 2 nothing, and it felt like the shots on goal were at least 10 nothing. And it was, I mean, they, Calgary had the puck in the Oilers zone for, <clears throat> must have been two minutes straight, and they were peppering shots at uh, Olivier Rodrigue. And finally, he, uh, he he punted out a fat rebound into the slot, and the guy scored on the rebound. And then it was, I think, 21 seconds later that something went awry in the neutral zone, and all of a sudden, Calgary's barging in on a two-on-one, and now another rebound and another tap in from close range, and it's 2 nothing. And at this point, Oilers have barely had the puck, and it looked like <laughs> this is going to be a long awful night but it was uh i mean the damage was already done in a a very important sense Uh, i mean we'll learn the particulars later i hope but uh uh it it, uh uh, they they just weren't quite ready for prime time but to their credit they found a way to turn it on turn it around and they were actually i'd say the better team in the last 30 minutes of the game yeah my bad thing is the Samarokov injury. It, it, it overshadows the game, quite frank. Like frankly, it does. Like it's just it's what it, it's on everybody's mind, except apparently Tony Brar, who who had a chance to ask the coach about it after the game and didn't. Yeah. So that you know might have asked that anyway. Um, yeah, Samarokov out last half halfway through last year with a shoulder injury. I think he had surgery on it, and. Yeah. Um, and he just got cleared to play last week. He comes mm-hmm. to camp and he wows everybody in his first couple of days at camp. He's oh. so big, he's so huge, he's so damn good. Um, and he gets on the ice. You know, he's 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 literally the most promising guy that might make the Oilers right now, yes. other than Dylan Holloway, possibly. Well, yeah. And you know, they both are out now. Now we we don't know how long Sam Rukov's out. It could be just precautionary they kept him out of the game or it could be worse than that and it's 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 just 
what a blow that would be to obviously to the player or the organization and the fans would be really unhappy. What can you say, Bruce? It's a tough physical game. He, he's a, he's a physical hockey player. The, these things happen to players. I just hope he's okay. And then later in the game, three minutes left, just, just a dirty hit. Oh. Um, by a Calgary Flames player, suspendable. I don't know if they suspend people for preseason games, but he, you know, hit from behind. Right into the boards. Yeah, on Xavier Borgo, and uh, Borgo goes head first, slams into the boards, gets up. He he walked, got off the ice on his own volition, did he not? Well, he was, he had help, but he was down for several minutes uh, right. in the corner, and they they got him up, and he did kind of coast off to the bench, but. Uh, uh, he was not going fast. I mean, the trainer was walking in sort of running okay. shoes beside him, and he was going the same speed as Borgo was. <sighs> and he went straight down the tunnel. And uh, that it, I I had the impression that he was probably all right, but like it wasn't obvious going off holding one arm, you know, or, or uh, uh, you know, sometimes where there's an obvious, you know, injury to some body part or other. There was nothing quite like that, but he certainly was dazed and confused. And uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 they got to get that crap out of the game, David. I mean, the guy saw nothing but Borgo's numbers. He was three feet from the boards and he followed through hard and he sent him flying right into the dasher. Two and minutes for that? That was ridiculous. He got two minutes, yeah. It, it, to me, it was a, a slam <clears> Five major. minutes, yeah. Especially, yeah. you know, it, it's a nothing game. I mean, it, it's... It, but he cost his team the game. I mean, it should have been as simple as that with a stupid penalty. Um, it's an asinine play. Yeah. You know, anyway, yeah. It, it's, a, it's, it's a tough game to play. It happens fast. You, they have yeah. to be aggressive. They've got to hit. They've got to be physical. Yeah. So these things will happen now and then. But they should just be punished severely. I, I'm not, you know, the hit's one thing. Like, you know, if you want to deter it, punish it. Otherwise, it keeps going on. So anyway, yeah. Uh, Hopefully he's all right. And I have I, I have grave concerns about Samarkov. And if it's a shoulder injury, like they said, left shoulder, and I I never have seen a video of it. Like the game still hasn't been posted. Usually they post the entire game after on the Oilers website. That doesn't happen yet. And their idea of highlights is showing the four Oilers goals and nothing else from the entire game. <laughs> Do you so, get? How about some saves? How about some, you know, some good plays? You know, goals for the other team. I mean, they're highlights, right? Anyway, uh, so I have not re-seen the play, but I, I do, do know it was an extremely violent collision in, in the neutral zone. And uh, the game was almost a no-hitter for, for two periods after that, but it picked up again late in the second. It was, uh, if he's re-injured his shoulder, I mean, Coming into camp, I thought the two Oilers with the best chance, the Oilers rookies with the best chance to make the team soon, if not right away, are these two guys, Dylan Holloway and Dmitry Smarkov. And Holloway never saw the ice before his injury became a re-injury that needed a second surgery. Now <sighs> Smarkov played one freaking shift and off he went injured. One shift. So... You know what, David? I went to this game and I thought, here, my game plan is I'm actually going to track Dmitry Smarkov for the whole game because I, what I saw yesterday and what I saw last year, I thought he's close to making the team. I just want to sort of keep track of everything he does in this game, good and bad. And before I even realized he was on the ice, he was getting run over by this guy and night over. So that plan went away. <laughs> That was going to be my post tomorrow, but well, I here's, have to think about something else. You know, sometimes it's the next day and they're at practice and they're okay. So that's what I'm hoping. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. All right, Bruce, uh, the Oilers roster is now, I think, complete for training camp. Um, they signed Kyler Yamamoto to a one-year, $1.1 billion and something contract. Um, Bruce, it's... Um, I'm glad he signed. I'm glad that the Oilers got him at a at a low contract value. Um, I don't even know if there was much alternative, Bruce. When when you start to look at the Oilers' cap situation going forward, 
I don't know where the hell they're, they're going to find the money to sign both Pulley RV and, and Yamamoto. Their contracts are both up at the end of this year. If they both, let's say they both get 20 goals and 50 points, right? Yeah. There is no money. Right. W- where is the money coming from? Koskinen's contracts coming off the books, but you need to, you're going to need a goalie, another goalie. And Darnell Nurse is getting, what, a three and a half, four million dollar raise. All of Koskinen's money is essentially going to be transferred over to Nurse, and then yep. they'll have like Skinner or Konavala backing up Mike Smith or something. Like, where is the rest of the money going to come from? So th- that's what kind of I was glad Yamamoto signed, but yep. that's what started to like the reality of the Oilers cap situation is sinking in, and it is dire. I was hoping for two years for Yamamoto just so that he and uh, Puliyarvi <laughs> wouldn't be up at the same time. Uh, but uh, the Oilers only really held the hammer over him for the first year, and so they wound up just getting him for the first year. And I think it was zero coincidence that the dollar figure they settled on, $1.175 million, which is a fairly precise figure, is in fact precisely the uh, cap hit of one Yesipo Viarvi, who signed a two-year deal at that average annual value last year. So they're basically saying, have at her, boys, and may the best man win. And and handicapping them the same in terms of their their cap <clears> hit <throat> in 2020-21. Uh, but the tough thing is, as you say, I got so many contracts on the books. And unfortunately, any, any um, uh, contract that has even two years left on it right now <clears throat> is one that's still going to be on the books next uh, spring. When these two young guys come up, first round draft picks from uh, uh, 2016 and 2017 uh, that are that are coming up, and of course they've got McDavid and Drysaddle and uh, uh, Nugent Hopkins, but they've also got uh, uh, the huge raise to Nurse that you mentioned. They've added Zach Hyman at over five million a year. They've added Duncan Keith at over five million a year, and all of those contracts are multi-year deals. I mean, the Keith deal is only two years; it's not eight or seven like some of them. But two means that that contract's still going to be in the way next uh, next summer when the Oilers are looking for dollars and and ability to uh, uh, keep one or both of their young right wingers. Even get, keeping one of them, let's say they, you know, you give them uh, that six-year, five million dollar a year contract. That I don't, I don't. They can't do that. So Bruce, here's, you know, you look at it. <clears throat> here's what's coming off the books next year. So Turris and Archibald, Turris is earning one point six five, and Archibald earning one point five. Let's say they they decide, okay, we're going to go with younger winger, younger players. Mm-hmm. So you know, we'll, they'll they'll only cost us eight hundred thousand each. Right. So you get about a million and a half there, losing mm-hmm. those two contracts. Um, then you Chris Russell's contract ends, but that's just a million two, right? Um, and Koskinen's contract ends. That's but you it. Need a new goalie. That's it. But you need a new goalie, Bruce. Mm-hmm. There's no like people are saying they're the orders are going to have seven million, like seven million dollars, or t- like I hear all these like they've got nothing. They don't have any cap space, so they have to trade someone if they're going to sign. And we all know who that somebody is. It's Zach Cassian, and he's earning three point two million. Three more years. Yeah, I should have mentioned that. I was talking about the five million guys, but Cassian is next in line on that list. They signed Cody CC for three point two five for four. Like I just again, like I really hope Cody CC plays well. Well, Good, good. I just have major misgivings about that contract. I just think it's going to haunt the order so it, you know or i fear it because i don't i don't have a i don't know it's just an intuition and again i hope i'm wrong on this one but even to sign one of these players if they have if if they if he has a big year is going to be a major challenge okay so that said they still haven't had big years so i hope they do that i hope they have both of them have really good years and then they'll have to trade one of them and uh, if they can't move well, they're just going to, if they can't move CC and Cassian and Fogel or something, you know, like a whole bunch, of, like they, they're just so packed in there now with their salary cap that um, there's major trouble on the way. I just think that's <laughs> the best way to put it. 
when Duncan Keith's contract runs out, so Keith's earning five and a half million, you know, that's when Evan Bouchard, his contract runs out in two years. Well, Evan mm-hmm. Bouchard has two more years on his ELC. Right. That's the good news. They can essentially take what they're paying Keith and then start paying that to Evan Bouchard if he pans out as a hockey player. Um, you know, that would be the idea, I think. You know, that so that might work on defense. You know, there's a kind of a succession plan. But with these two young forwards, like, they're competing this year head-to-head for, for one job, as, as mm-hmm. far as I can tell. I think the orders, if they bend, twist, and shout... They will be able to find cap space to sign one more winger to like, you know, three, four, five million dollar contract. But I can't, they can't do it with a two guys. You know, they chose Warren Fogle um, this summer, yeah. I guess. They gave him the three, two point seven five million dollar. And so I hope he's good too. Yeah. Maybe. Well, he needs to be good now that they're paying him. They're paying him. So yeah, it was just a little bit. It really hit me over the head when I was looking at the, looking at it today and, and thinking about Yamamoto and Pulley RV going forward. Yeah. yeah I hope they, maybe I'm missing something, but I don't, I don't see what I'm, I don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah. Well, they got 12 uh, contracts <laughs> that they're paying in 22, 23 that are $2.2 million and more. Right, they got a couple of cheap ones in uh, Devon Shore and Slater Kukuk that are signed for two years, where the second year is cheap, and they and they have uh, some ELCs that might enter the equation. Uh, but these other deals, I mean, they're committed to, and there's no easy way to get rid of them. And you can only bury. I mean, if it's 2.2 million, you can bury half of it at most. If it's five million, you can bury a fifth of it. You know, so. Mm-hmm. They've got, uh, you know, obviously McDavid, Drysaddle, Hyman, Nugent Hopkins, Cassian, Fogel, all making big money up front on the blue line. Nurse, Keith, Barry, who we haven't mentioned yet, Clefbaum, <clears throat> and Cece. Now, the Clefbaum contract, they will be able to bury that, but only after they jump through some hoops and cause them some headaches before the season starts next year, just as it will this year, just as it did last year. And... Then they have the one contract in net with Mike Smith, which is, you know, at least it's not huge dollars or anything, but uh, they're probably going to need to invest some money at that position. And there's not a lot of money to invest anywhere. It's been it's been committed. Yeah, they really went all in uh, this year when they signed CC. Like they really. Um, that seems to me the to be the one they ne- didn't necessarily need to do. They would have had to bet, I guess, on a, a younger player. They would have paid Larson the same or more, though. If they, you know, I mean, that's he's true. Bruce. Kind of filling in for Larson. So if he was, as, if he's as good as Larson, I won't say a word. So, right. yeah, um, that's what he's got to be because they're going to need him to be that. You know, Barry's contract's up in three years. That's when yeah. Broberry's ELC's up. So yeah. it's, you know, so there's there's lots of good players in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to need them because they're going to yeah. be, they're going to be, this is going to be painful in a way that we haven't seen. We haven't ever had this kind of pain before Bruce, where the orders are a good team, probably a winning team. And they got to say bye to players that are really good and young because they can't yeah, afford, afford them. Maybe. And other teams have faced this. They've, they've, yeah. they've had to deal with this. So the, here's the, here's the reality of when your team is in the top eight in the league, which we hope the orders are this year, when they're one of the, you know, the elite eight, mm-hmm. um, this is what happens. So here we go. It's going to be a hell of a debate between the Yamamoto and Pulley RV fans this year. I have a, I, <laughs> I, I think most people like both of them, of course, but yeah. Anyway, it's, it's pretty clearly a direct competition between the two of them at this point. Yeah. And, Hopefully, I mean, hopefully they both have great years, and if they have to deal one of them, they'll get a big return for them, you know? Yeah. But it would, the big return would have to be affordable players or futures, you know, that's the problem. Yeah. So. All righty. Well, let's leave it there tonight for yeah. tonight, Bruce, unless you have anything anything you'd like to add. The only other comment I was going to make is that the one thing that, that um, I feared during all this long Yamamoto uh situation was that Seattle Kraken would come to their senses and and uh, make him an offer sheet and they could have offered him something reasonably uh, low like three 
to four million dollars on a say five year deal where they wouldn't even have to give up a first round pick to the Oilers and the Oilers would have been forced to either match it or just take a, a lower draft pick back single one than the one they expended on Yamamoto in the first place. And with him being a Washington state native, uh, you know, that was born and was in Washington and <clears throat> played there, I thought he'd be a natural fit for Seattle, but, uh, they don't appear to be aggressive in that matter, and it's a, it's a good thing for the Oilers that they're not. They thank were goodness very that, vulnerable. Very thank vulnerable goodness Bouchard's that. ELC seems to have this, like it seems to be going forever. <laughs> so I don't know how that happened, but I'm glad it happened. And, slide, uh, slide, slide. Yeah, it's two more two more <laughs> years. Because if he if his contract was coming up and he had a good year this year and they had to sign all three, there's just no, no money. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Maybe they can. Maybe they can make a trade. Like if they could get out from the Cassian deal without any poison pill. Um, yeah, that would be that would be huge. All right, let's leave it there, Bruce. Um, thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, and we will not have a podcast on Monday night, as I understand, after the game in Calgary, because both you and Kurt are hard at work on the covering the Canadian election. So we'll just uh, we'll report on that game, but we'll get back to podcasting. Uh, when the orders exhibition season starts. Indeed. Thanks again, Bruce. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.